where I had been in the Queensy Studios complex. Uh, when they all left to go six years ago, I stayed on. But unfortunately, the developers have decided that they wanted to move, so I, I had to move after 29 years. And I was very lucky to be offered this particular space in the engineering gallery. When I was in Queen Street, I was I had a lovely view out into the hills. <laughs> so so when I wasn't painting, I could sit and dream. And but then they went and built a nine-story student accommodation block in, in front of us. So that, that I, I lost that view. <laughs> I mean, we've lost so many of our old buildings. And I, I quite often been on Facebook photograph old photographs, which remind me of what Belfast used to look like. And we had lovely buildings which were demolished and replaced by things which are bland. This was a very, very lively street. First Italian restaurant was in this street. And now it's just derelict. And of course the developers, they buy all these buildings. They don't care. And they wait until the leases are up. So it's been like that now for 15, 20 years. And nothing's being done. And it just kills the whole space. I had my first... Uh, exhibition in 1960. After I, after I graduated I went, uh, I, I, had, I had been as a student over in Swanage in Dorset and I got to know an Irish painter there called Padraig McMahon and he suggested I go to Ibiza which at that time was very much an artist colony. So I had two months in Ibiza and started to paint seriously. So three of us decided to put on an exhibition and as it got near the time it became very obvious that the the other two didn't have any work, so I thought it's an awful waste of you know, this opportunity. So I, I said I would put on a one-man show, and so instead of instead of just putting in six paintings, I suddenly worked like a lunatic painting dozens of bits of hardboard, anything that was lying around, and put on a show, and that was my first show in 1960 in the Georgian Rooms in Belfast, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> when I started painting, I was always interested in human drama. I was interested in painting things like isolation, vulnerability, and uh, it was all sort of like a general angst. And then suddenly I thought, there's a drama happening on my own doorstep. How, how can I ignore it? And I started initially to just sort of doc document little drawings. But I, I then felt I wanted to comment on it. I thought, how do I comment on it? I didn't really know for quite a few years what to do. And then I had I had been putting a paint, making paintings with a, a bride and a clown and a bride and a little ventriloquist doll who was like her son. And one day I went into the studio and he was lying on the floor and he looked so much like an assassination victim that I thought I could, I, I drew him. And as soon as I saw that I thought here is a poetic language that I could use to highlight what was going on and replace hypocrisy of politicians, the punishment beatings and so on. I was very angry because I taught in a boys school and I was very aware of them being sucked into the paramilitaries and how easy it was to manipulate young ideals to turn somebody who's an idealist into a terrorist was very easy and I was very angry about that. So that all bled into this general thing that I had about the human drama so that the paintings they weren't so much about the troubles they were about me trying to find out who I am, living in a troubled society. And I found at that particular time, it was always like these paintings were being dictated to me. Once I had the, the, the props in the theatre, they, they just suggested a whole story. I don't exactly know what the story is, um, but basically from that period on, I've allowed the paintings to speak to me, to tell me what to paint. Obviously, you can't you can't be angry forever, and you can't be. You know, the, 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 as as a semblance of peace came, I had to go back to what I used to do, which was the clown and the bride and the theatre. Um, but the thing was, I was very aware. My wife and I we used to go to the holidays in Scotland, to escape. But no matter where you went. You always heard about Ulster, some atrocity has happened. So even even in the, these modern paintings where there's something going on, there's still an element, there's still an unease that uh, it follows you <laughs> wherever you go. So e even, even in the paintings which are ostensibly peaceful and quiet, there's a sort of 
a hint of a background of a history that isn't exactly right. I've done things about the flag protest and I, I did a series of paintings called Mask Requiem which was a kind of metaphor for decommissioning. It was pretty obvious that decommissioning was a bit of a con, that a lot of the uh, rifles and so on were, were just buried but somebody knows where they're buried and they could quite easily be lifted up again. So I just had this series of what I did called a Mask Requiem where the masks were buried. So it's, a, it's that kind of uh, poetic, still, still the same kind of poetic element, but not as obviously political. When I started to introduce landscape, it got away from the sort of the claustrophobia of Belfast City. I'm quite often surprised. I look at I look at some of them now and I go, "Who painted those?" <laughs> I can't, I can't, I I can accept responsibility for sixty percent of it, but the other forty percent, I don't know where it's come from. The poetry tend to be um, a little bit more humorous or um, tongue-in-cheek initially. Um, I mean, I, I was actually a member of Philip Housewalm's group with uh, Seamus Heaney and Michael Longley and Muldoon. And I found that I didn't, I, I seem to be out of step with their poetry. They all seem to be interested in the countryside and I was a tiny. So my poems, I was more influenced by American poets such as Kenneth Patchen, Ferlinghetti, Corso, and, and a modern environment. It, se it seemed to be taking an awful lot of time to get people to realise that something had happened since 1940 poetry. And uh, so for a long time pe people didn't know that I, that I wrote poetry. So I just bought out little books of my own. Uh, didn't exactly change the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I still do write that poetry has always been, for me, trying to deal with life that was happening and as I say I stopped for a long time, started, stopped, started, stopped and started. Um, I wrote quite a lot when my wife died, obviously it was therapy for me. I used to do quite a lot of readings, in fact it was very funny because for one of the anniversaries of the Ulster, of the Union, Ulster State they had a festival in, in the Botanic Avenue and uh, it was, there were like little tents and uh, I think that was the last time I read because I, I realised that when you're performing I've been to a lot of poetry readings which are very boring so um, I thought I'll read the more humorous poems well the humorous poems went down really well but the, the other poets accused me of bringing my own crowd in and I felt and I just sort of thought that, that that attitude just sort of put me off the whole thing, and I, I think I was about the last time that I read it publicly. After my wife died, I woke up one morning and a particular line was going through my head, watch me walk through the light. And I immediately got up out of bed and I went to the laptop, and the poem just wrote itself in f five minutes. But, but that, was, that was the kind of thing where I was obviously it was the time for me to do it. I must say I haven't written anything now for about two years, but it'll come. I was brought up with a strict Methodist upbringing and they didn't believe in dancing. So we, were, we, we never were taught how to dance or anything. And uh, when my boys were about 15 and 16, they belonged to a youth club and we were invited over to Middlesbrough as part of the taking, taking kids out of the troubles thing kind of and uh, they had a disco and I was just supervising uh, turning around and I noticed that uh, the first two numbers all the girls were up and then a particular number came on and the girls all disappeared and the guys all got up 12 or 15 guys and they started doing this very acrobatic dancing and it was the first time I'd ever seen Northern Soul and the funny thing was I felt, I felt, I could feel my body, like I want to get up there and do that too. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. And I can remember we used to go to the Empire Music Hall, Rob McCulloch, and uh, nobody would be up dancing. And like, it seemed to me they were waiting for me to dance and then they would get up. You know, you needed somebody to start the thing for them. And my wife used to say, don't let us be the first up, please. 
and I was just saying, no matter what we want, if the right number comes up, well, fine, we'll be up. The cashier number 39, it was, um, I got an email asking me if I would dance, and of course I thought it was somebody taking the mic, so I ignored it. And then I got another and from a girl that I knew, um, and she said, no, it was, it was genuine that her boyfriend played in the band, and they'd seen me dancing at one of Terry Hooley's gigs, and they would like me to do it. And I said, well, send me the tape. And it was awful funny because I was 72 at the time, so I then claimed that I'd become a professional dancer at the age of 72 because they paid me. And I said, I can now, I can now apply for a green card as a doctor. <laughs> Before COVID, I had the large paintings and exhibited in the Sea Holly Gallery and upstairs here. And unfortunately, they only got out shown for a week. So um, Clifford has offered me again to show them here. So I'm hoping to put the big paintings up, the big political paintings. Um, the reason was that um, I have a grandson who's about 28, and he went up to the Ulster Museum to see my. I have a big painting in the Ulster Museum called Peace Talks. And he hadn't realised that the paintings were at that scale. He had only seen them in books and photographs. And I realised that there's a whole generation his age who didn't know me, didn't know my work. So, so um, when the opportunity came to show them, I was quite happy to resurrect them and bring them out. Uh, but as I say, unfortunately, COVID killed them. So um, I hope to have five of them in the Fender Rescue Gallery in June and about eight of them in here in the same time, I hope. I'm basically working on one, two, a bit, working on four or five of them at the same time. My son went to travel, uh, and he came back with little worry dolls, and uh, I thought they looked also like p girls in national costume. So when they appear in the paintings, they represent nationalism. So they, they, they would appear in quite a lot of my work. This is in a very early stage. Just keep keep working away and eventually it'll come together, I hope. I wrote a poem called where are they now? Which was my, me as a teacher talking about the boys that I had taught. And it was, it was produced in the Belfast Telegraph. And I got a lovely letter from a woman. Said how much she appreciated about her boys and how they used to go with innocent pastimes and got involved in it. So um, I realised that cert there are certain poems which uh, do touch people. Somebody said to me, I, I was dancing one time down in Dublin, the guy said, will you teach me those moves? I said, no, I don't know what moves. I have no idea what you're talking about moves, you know. Um, the funny thing was, I was always interested in dance. I mean, Ethel and I used to go to ballet, and uh, I was always interested in, and I was always you know, interested in, in the dancers and top of the pops kind of thing. So that um, it was something that I only found out when I was about 30-something, and I've been making up for it ever since. <laughs> we often wonder about whether our has any influence. I had an exhibition of these painting, political paintings up in the Orchard Gallery in Derry and my wife noticed that there was a woman in the corner who was crying and she went over and she asked, are you all right? And she says, your husband has put it all down for me. And I realised then that there is a power that I, that I was somehow or other, I, I, was cre I was, things which were sort of amorphous and floating around in her head, I'd given them some kind of concrete shape and it was all trying to find metaphors, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to do the obvious things like burning buildings and bomb building. I wanted to get down to the psyche that was going on. How, how, how have we got to this position? What was what, what it in the Ulster psyche that has made us like this, this awful bigotry, this awful hate? It's, it's almost like uh, in the twilight of my years, I'm pulling it all together in strands. 
that I can. Um, and one of the things was I, I had an auction, an auction of paintings in 1960 to 1990, and I looked at paintings I kept saying, is that the way I used to paint? And I, did I paint like that in 1966? Why did I stop doing that? So I've, I've started to, I started to actually introduce those into, I, I did a series called The Mass Maker Studio, and that gave me the excuse to put some of the older paintings in. For me, it was a therapy, uh, and I'd like to think it might be therapy for other people as well.